1844, a group of fishermen rowed out into the freezing waters of the North Atlantic. Their destination was Eldi, a giant sea stack 13 miles off the southwest coast of Iceland. They were risking their lives, driven to find a seabird so rare that a single specimen would raise a small fortune. Clumsy and flightless, once they spotted it, the bird was doomed. The creature they'd killed was called the Great Orc. This was the last confirmed sighting of the species, even though people went on searching for decades. Ironically, the Great Orc had been killed for the very people who most wanted to save it. For millions of years, the North Atlantic was home to one of the most remarkable seabirds ever, the Great Orc. A mere 250 years ago, you could see thousands of them in vast colonies. Now, they're all gone. Today, the only great orcs that remain gather dust in Victorian museum collections. Just 80 specimens. All dead. Stuffed. They date from the 19th century, when the great orc captured the public imagination. Its eggs changed hands for huge sums of money. It even became a brand name. Yet, despite the Victorian fascination with it, the bird was a mystery. Scientists were ignorant of how many there were, where it lived, how it lived, or how it had evolved, until it was too late. Even the penguin-like appearance of the great orc is deceptive. Ornithologist Errol Fuller has studied and collated every stuffed museum specimen known to exist. The great orc is a very interesting example of convergent evolution. It looks very much like a penguin, but in fact it isn't. It's not related to the penguins at all. It's related to the birds that we call now guillemots, razorbills, even puffins. That's where its affinities lie. But it happens to look very much like a penguin because it lived very much the same kind of life. The orc was larger than the average penguin and it was a far superior killer. No penguin ever evolved such an effective weapon. A beak, long, sleek and sharp enough to slice through prey in a single bite. And to chase its victims underwater it was more agile than the penguin. At the top of the bird, the beak is compressed so that that doesn't offer much water resistance. Then the bird is generally beautifully streamlined. This bird would have been superbly sleek and hydrodynamic with very small wings so they don't resist against the, the pull of the water. And when we get to the, down towards the bottom, the feet are, are thrown very far back. All those things conspire to make this bird like a torpedo in the water. Guillemots and razorbills may be the orc's closest living relatives, but there's a crucial difference between them. This guillemot has very long wings, and that tells us immediately that this is a bird of flight. The wings on the great orc are really very, very short, and you see that they couldn't possibly have enabled a bird of this size to take to the air. The orc and the guillemot were most alike, not in the air, but under the water. For biologist Donald Kroll, guillemots and orcs stand comparison with the ocean's most magnificent creatures. 
we think of sperm whales as being these amazing long duration divers and elephant seals, long duration deep divers. But if you scale it to their body size, you're talking about an animal that weighs thousands of kilos versus a bird that weighs one kilo. So pound for pound, what these birds are doing is just absolutely astounding. They're the deepest and longest diving animals that have ever existed on Earth. And so pound for pound, the great auk might have even been a better diver. The auk's much reduced flipper-like wings now had less surface area, enabling the bird to power through water that's many times denser than air. But to dive so deep, it had paid a price. What these birds did is essentially, in an evolutionary sense, make the great sacrifice. They gave up the ability to fly in order to become the supreme divers, if you will. And so the great auks were probably one of the, the, the best northern hemisphere divers uh, that existed. And so it really was quite an, an amazing evolutionary transition. All this happened to make the great auk a devastating underwater predator. For over 10 months of the year, the auk lived entirely in the open ocean, hunting schooling fish like capelin. But the flightlessness that made the great auk such a successful underwater hunter also made it uniquely vulnerable. On land, the bird was clumsy and highly at risk from any predator that could get near it. Its only defense was to live as far away from predators as possible, and that wasn't easy. The great auk, of course, was the northern hemisphere's last flightless seabird, and uh, their flightlessness made them vulnerable on a number of levels. One is that they had to breed in areas where they could come ashore without having to fly ashore. So they had to be able to come ashore in some place where there was a beach, and that kind of limited where they could breed. There were precious few places the flightless great orc could have gone. Cliffs and rocky coastlines would have been out of their reach. 40 miles off Newfoundland, on the eastern coast of Canada, lie the Grand Banks. An area of shallows, with an archipelago of tiny islands and drifting icebergs close to where the Titanic went down. For millions of years, this was the Orcs' stronghold. Ecologist Bill Montevecchia searches for traces of the bird he knows he'll never find alive among the islands. You know, there's always been a bit of mystery about these birds and about these islands. I still look for them, you know. I mean, I know they're not there. I still look for them, right? I mean, because of that sort of presence of, of them having been here. Look at these islands here. They're flat. They're just like pancakes. And this is a perfect island for a flightless bird. This is the kind of island that Great Auk had to have. Isolated and uninhabited, the orc lived here and nowhere else along the North American coast, undisturbed for millennia. But 500 years ago, it suddenly came under attack. In here is a skull of a great auk that I dug on Funk Island. This is the, uh, the beak, quite uh, incredible, powerful beak. This, this was all... Uh, one piece that actually subsequently fragmented. There's a few cracks in the cranium of the bird here. It might have been where it was uh, banged over the head. Out here, only one predator could have done this, man. In the 16th century, explorers set off from all over Europe to cross the Atlantic in search of the New World. Frenchman Jacques Cartier was one of them. After sailing for months across the uncharted ocean in search of the Northwest Passage, his ship came across these islands. For the half-starved crew, what they found here proved a godsend. The crews are stressed for protein, for food, six to eight week crossings of an Atlantic Ocean that's tough. You don't have a refrigerator, you've, you've got dried meat, you've got salted meat, 
and you're lucky to be alive by the time you get to this side. So Cartier is sailing over here, up on the northeast coast, he finds this flat island covered with flightless birds. I mean, he couldn't have hit anything any better. For centuries, you know, this flat island really was the first fast food takeout in North America. Hunted for food, the great orc suddenly turned from predator to prey. Yet its extinction is no open and shut case. Ultimately, was man the scientist more to blame than man the hunter? Seabird ever to exist in the Northern Hemisphere. 500 years ago, the flat islands off the coast of Newfoundland would have been covered with millions of them. Ecologist Bill Montevecchia knows that it had taken to the water so completely, only one thing brought the great orc to land, sex. They didn't have to. Great auks would never come to islands. And what compels them to come there is because they have to lay their eggs on solid land. It's also where they meet their mates and copulate and produce that egg in the first instance. For many seabirds, the huge population density of the colony is necessary for successful reproduction. Like guillemots, orcs may well have paired for life. As this female's breeding partner approaches, she wobbles and gurgles to greet him. He taps his beak against hers, and they preen each other. They incubate the egg for about 40 days taking turns to keep it warm while the other one looks for food. The swap over is a painstaking business and can be perilous. But not as perilous as what was about to happen. With the arrival of hungry sailors, the great orc had to cope with the threat that evolution had not prepared it for. Flightless and unable to escape, they made easy pickings. Thousands were slaughtered summer after summer. Yet killing orcs for food was only the beginning of the end. We don't think that's why there are no great orcs here today. We think it was a systematic killing that occurred in the 1700s when crews of men went there to live there, to stay there, to slaughter these birds for a very specific reason. That reason was fashion. 200 years after Europeans first arrived, the killing changed gear as hunters switched their attention from food to feathers. Orc feathers were sold to make mattresses and even became fashionable in ladies' hats. Thousands of birds were captured, killed, and dumped into cauldrons where they were boiled just long enough to make their feathers easy to pluck. In the thin covering of soil on the islands, Bill has uncovered physical evidence of the carnage. Got uh, some metal uh, pieces and plates that were pieces of cauldrons that perhaps were used to, uh, to parboil the birds to get to the down underneath the waterproof feathers. Also this hook, which, which I presume was a hook that would have, uh, you know, maybe held the cauldron over a fire where the birds could have been parboiled, you know. The oily fatty birds were used as the fuel uh, to keep the fires burning and you can actually find these pieces of charcoal and if you look really carefully you can see where the feather shafts of the birds were it was that real systematic uh, you know over killing of the animals in 1785 captain george cartwright adventurer and trapper observed it has been customary of late years for crews of men to live all summer on the island for the sole purpose of killing birds for the sake of their feathers. The destruction which they have made is incredible. If a stop is not soon put to that practice, the whole breed will be diminished to almost nothing. And that's exactly what happened. By the 19th century, the vast colonies on the islands off Newfoundland had been completely destroyed. 
but this species survived. There was still hope. Across the Atlantic was one other refuge. The last great orcs off the fishing banks of Newfoundland were seen uh, in the mid-19th century, but really the species had ceased to breed there, and the only remaining breeding colony of the great orc uh, in the whole world was on a tiny island off the southwestern tip of Iceland. But it was about 26 miles from the mainland, so it was a dangerous procedure to go out there. Isolated from the threat of man, in Iceland it seemed the great orc had finally found a safe haven. And for hundreds of years, Icelandic folklore even helped protect this colony from humans, who were too scared to go there. This little island was uh, invested with quite fearful stories. People had died going out there in the 1620s. There were stories going back to the 14th century of somebody who lived there and survived a winter, refused to tell anybody how he'd survived. So the story grew up that he'd been looked after by the Hilda folk, who were these uh, fairies and ghosts. These haunted islands protected the birds, but then nature, not man, dealt them another blow. In March 1830, an undersea volcano erupted. The orc's refuge exploded and disappeared beneath the waves. But even the hand of nature couldn't drive the orc to total extinction. About 40 pairs survived the eruption. The birds had one other place that they could breed on, which they never had bred on, because it was 13 kilometers nearer to the mainland and not ideally suitable but this was the one that they chose after 1830. The bird really didn't have much chance of survival once it had uh, chosen a breeding site that was so near to the mainland. This last haven was Eldi, and the orcs sought refuge here just as scientific interest and sympathy for its plight was growing. Yet at this time, the study of natural history meant collecting and classifying, pickling, preserving, and stuffing. The rarer the orc became, the more sought after it was. This was the golden era of natural history collecting, when every gentleman worth his salt would feel the need to put together a large collection of natural history items, stuffed animals, stuffed birds, birds' eggs, and at the same time, the great institutional museums of the world were becoming interested in natural history specimens. So the great orc, of course, in its declining years, corresponded with just these years when this great surge in natural history collecting was taking place. But in their enthusiasm for collecting, Victorian scientists neglected animal behavior and failed to understand that with the loss of the orc's breeding colonies, it was already on the very brink of extinction. Once the numbers fell below a certain level, even though that level may have been quite considerable, the bird was doomed. And we can almost test that, because if this had been a bird that could have lived in threes and fours, six and sevens, tens and twelves, it would still be among us today, because it could have always found little lonely coves, lonely islands in the North Atlantic where just a few individuals could live. The fact that we don't find it today is proof, surely, of the fact that this was a bird that could only live in colonies of large numbers. This was a fatal misunderstanding, because now, in their ignorance, Victorian scientists unwittingly pushed the great orb to its final extinction. On LD in 1844, the hunting trip was undertaken at the request of a keen Danish collector of rare birds and their eggs, Carl Simson. One of dozens of dealers across Europe, he believed he was furthering the cause of scientific knowledge as well as making a handsome profit. Birds like this one, and all the ones we see in museums, almost without exception, were caught on the island of Eldi. And they were caught by an Icelandic fisherman who landed on the island with a certain amount of difficulty, actually approached the bird, grabbed it because it was so helpless on land, unlike in the water, probably wrung its neck there and then on Eldi, took it back to their fishing village, 
skinned it, ate the body, and then sold the skin for comparatively small amounts to traders in Reykjavik, who then sold them on to museums in Europe. By 1844, far from providing a refuge, Eldi was more like a prison, where the last remaining breeding pair of orcs awaited the inevitable. Even then, no one realized that the great orc was now extinct. It was confidently asserted that colonies thrived even further north in Arctic waters. Scientific interest continued unabated. It wasn't perhaps till a decade after the, the great orc actually became extinct that scientists went to Iceland seriously looking for it. And by then, of course, it was too late for them to find it. As the years went by, the very scarcity of the bird only managed to increase demand for dead specimens, driving prices higher and higher. It started off at amounts like five pounds, 10 pounds, but by, by say 1870, you'd have got 40 pounds for a great orc. By 1900, you'd have got 350 pounds for a great orc. Now, 350 pounds was a huge sum of money at that time. Just to put it into context, you'd have probably been able to buy three or four houses with that amount of money. Orc mania ensured the bird was never more famous than the moment of its extinction. In the 1880s, novelist Charles Kingsley caricatured the bird standing on the All Alone Stone in his children's classic, The Water Babies. The great orc had become a mythical creature, but the opportunity to experience it for real had been lost forever. How did the mammoth meet its end? Extinct next week at 9 o'clock. And two books to accompany the series, Price £20 and Extinct Fact Files, Price £6.99, are out now. To order, call 0870 1234 344 or click onto channel4.com forward slash shop. Next on for the sinking of HMS Coventry in Going Critical.